My name is Bob Rose. I've lived in Parkdale for 40 years. Um, 32 years of that uh, employed at Parkdale Activity Recreation Center, which is a very important resource serving people who are marginalized by poverty, by homelessness, by mental health issues, disability, and frankly, just a general attitude of exclusion. Part of the theme of my conversation is about navigation. My own experience of navigation, and when I say navigation, I mean finding one's way, both on a personal level, but also on a professional level. Um, and the discoveries that I have made on that path of navigation, both in getting found and getting lost. I was born by the sea in Nova Scotia and Lunenburg. I had a foot in each of those communities. One of my most lasting experiences was the Saturday mornings that my grandfather would take me to a general store in downtown Lunenburg, give me a wax paper with sauerkraut on it, and set me down in the corner where I could watch the conversation of the fishermen and the captains and study their salt hardened hands, their rugged visages, and think to myself that they actually visually represented some of those qualities that I wanted to absorb within myself, the quality of endurance, commitment, fearlessness, loyalty, and frankly, love, love of the ocean, love of the sun rising and falling on the ocean. And I thought to myself, when I grow up, I want to be just like those men. My parents took me to Ontario where I basically lost my network of friends. I lost the ocean, I lost my grandfather. And I think for the first time in my life, I actually tasted um, loneliness and solitude and disconnection. When I reached my 20s, I had my first serious experience with clinical depression. I tried to resolve it by seeing a therapist, by taking pills, none of it worked. Ultimately, I decided that the only way that I was going to solve this problem, this great sadness, loneliness, uncertainty about how I was making my way in the world, who I was, what I was doing for a living, all of these things that I was going to solve this by putting myself in the woods for six weeks in a canoe trip. And, uh, and it did solve it, it uh, because I think I went deep inside and made some decisions um, about changing the direction of my life. In a simple way, I decided that I had never been so lonely as I was on that canoe trip and that I was never gonna be that way again, that I was gonna go back and I was gonna make relationships with people and I was going to work with people. So uh, as luck would have it, I returned from the canoe trip and got a call from a friend who invited me to apply for a position at the Clark in the forensic unit, um, working with people who were uh, placed there by the courts for mental health assessments. You know, I have to say that I was a very shy person, um, not comfortable with social relationships. and. And even shyer after spending six weeks in the woods in near silence. So it was, it, was, uh, it was surprising that when I walked onto the forensic unit and began to work there that I suddenly lost my shyness. Um, had, partly because I had such empathy for the people that were there and the level of suffering. But there was something within me, a set of skills that made it easier for me to understand what people were trying to communicate, um, irrespective of how chaotic they may have sounded. And so an uh, opportunity to work in a, what was a new pilot case management program launched by the province um, came up and I applied and was given a position. So 
that meant I immediately transitioned from working in, a, to, in an institution <laughs> to being deinstitutionalized and working in the community. First hand view of just um, what had taken place when people were deinstitutionalized and the government broke its promises to create housing, to create employment opportunity, to create you know social supports. None of that was present, and um, people were living in the most adverse conditions that you can imagine. Certainly, conditions that weren't conducive to anybody's recovery. It was kind of like I didn't really expect that I, because of that, that I would so quickly become immersed in advocacy work. Advocacy uh, primarily focused around the housing situation that people were facing and the need to bring the governments to account. And I worked in that position for about three years until I resigned. I don't have what the survivor community is calling for, which is don't talk to us about medication. What we need is a home, a friend, and a job. And it was on those notes that I um, transitioned into the Parkdale Activity Recreation Center as a drop-in staff. It didn't take too long for me to kind of realize that I was meeting some of the same people that I worked with in the hospital all those years before. And uh, also that I was certainly seeing people that I knew from the community, having been an outreach worker. And, but now I was seeing them in a different kind of situation, in a social situation. And, uh, and that was the thing that impressed me most about Park, was I felt like, oh my goodness, I'm now working in the sea. It's a different kind of sea. It's a sea of stories, you know, a sea of people's um, hopes and needs, um, because that's the kind of place it was. It was very open. There was no files. There were no doctors. There was just this space. I suppose I spent a career at Park kind of collecting stories or looking for the wisdom in those stories and the ideas within those stories that could be used to develop programs. As Park got bigger, I became the program director, you know, one of the managers. And then at a certain point, there was kind of a tipping point where I was just working so hard that I became ill myself. I've never really expected all these years working in the mental health system and supporting other people and knowing how the system works and how to work it, um, that I myself would graduate from being an honorary survivor to be the primary participant. It makes a difference. So, uh, and also it's a bit complicated because I have a bit of a reputation in the community or a profile in the community so people would see me in the hospital and they'd say hi bob how are you doing i say oh okay what are you doing here and i'd say oh, i'm staying here and they would look at me with shock so i started to uh, compensate by um assuming the identity of a louisiana gunfighter and changing my name from Bob to Harry. It was Harry Rose, third man. And uh, I, I considered it an act of protection so I could be in the community. And people say, are you Bob Rose? And I'd say, no, I'm Harry Rose. Bob's my brother. I thought it was quite brilliant, frankly. But then again, I was extremely manic and high. But when I was in the hospital in that state, nobody came to talk to me. They just observed me. And I got a bit of, into a bit of conflict, with, let's just say, with the authority of the hospital. And then got to experience restraints. I thought nothing had changed. Nothing does change within the institutions. They're just calcified and rigid. And what happens when one becomes ill is that internal comfort seems to get lost or gets distorted um, and maybe even buried under feelings of shame 
uh, feelings of vulnerability, um, which can make an individual um, run, hide, um, do a lot of things that are, you know, run counter to what is needed for recovery. I forgot how I even had talked about vulnerability, which was, it shouldn't be a source of shame. It's really a source of love. I mean, where do we think that love comes from, except from vulnerability? It's a source of strength. But that gets forgotten in crisis. It gets forgotten particularly in social isolation, where there aren't people to remind you of your, the rest of yourself. So uh, a good part of me coming back had to do with, you know, having friends that wouldn't be uh, shuttered out of my life, even though I didn't want to talk to them or didn't want to pick up the phone. <laughs> they persisted in making contact with me, even when I was incapable of having any kind of conversation. Just being with someone to validate them as a human being is pretty important with respect to the healing process. I, I buried a couple of hundred people, 250 people in my career, you know. That's a lot of funerals, a lot of memorial services, a lot of memories of, mem of different members who I worked with and saw them die, you know, well before their time. There was a bit of a recovery of the compass that I had sort of built over the course of my work years at Park. So that kind of reminds me of my own journey from, you know, being the worker or being the manager um, with some oversight in terms of, and you know, providing support for people that are at risk. And then the transition into the direct experience of what it felt like to be at risk, it reminds me about how, my, how personal that struggle really is and how deeply it affects the hearts of people, um, not just their body, and not just their mind, but their hearts. And, uh, and I would safely say in all the, all the years that I've lived in Parkdale that I've always considered Parkdale to be a community with a great heart. I think it wants to keep that heart.